Um, again, thank you for meeting with us today, Mr. Hutt. Um, uh, we spoke a little bit on the phone yesterday. Uh, we're super excited to have, grateful to have you with us, and thank you for spending your time with us today. Uh, my name is Donovan Carter. Uh, today is February 18th, uh, 2022, and I am joined by two of my colleagues, Ms. Abby Lovett and the wonderful and lovely Ms. Deborah Hendricks. Um, uh, and today we are with, uh, can you introduce yourself and uh, state your name for the record? <clears throat> well, I'm Roy Hunt. My legal name is Elma Leroy Hunt, but I have always gone by Roy, and indeed I didn't know my legal name uh, was Elma Leroy Hunt until I got a Navy scholarship to go to Vanderbilt and had to get a copy of my birth certificate uh, <laughs> as part of the process. And uh, I was quite shocked to learn that my name was Elmer and Leroy. Mm -hmm. I knew I was named for my maternal grandfather, who was Roy. And uh, again, that's what I had always been called. Well, for 18 years, I had been wow. called. Uh, <clears throat> so, of course, I, in the government world, in the University of Florida world, I'm Elmer. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but I'm anywhere else, I'm Roy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's my full name and why. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit more about um, where you, who you are, where you're from? And well, I'm you from Humboldt, Tennessee, a uh, small town in West Tennessee. My uh, great, 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 great grandfather uh, moved to the area in 1821 oh. and founded a small Baptist church, which is still active. Uh, and so my family on both sides, my mother's and my father's, were long-time uh, residents of Gibson County, Tennessee. Uh, Humboldt is the largest town. It's really a bedroom community for Jackson, Tennessee today. It's about 17 miles north of Jackson. Uh, I grew up there, went to uh, public schools there until the 11th grade when I uh, finished my last two years at Columbia Military Academy in Columbia, Tennessee. Um, I was a, a good student, was valedictorian of my class, and won the physics, the senior and the junior medals, all of which helped me get the wonderful Navy scholarship to Vanderbilt, which was all inclusive. So I was very, very fortunate. Um, <clears throat> and at the conclusion, I had to repay the Navy for my scholarship. And <clears throat> I graduated on a Sunday and flew to Norfolk and boarded a ship, the battleship Wisconsin, uh, where I spent almost three years. Just before that, uh, my term ended, my three-year commitment, uh, the battleship was uh, decommissioned, yeah. and I helped put her into mothballs, and uh, I still had three months left, and I was sure they would let me out because I was, I had been accepted for law school at Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi. Uh, but I was wrong, and I was transferred to the USS Canberra guided missile cruiser, and that last period was spent in an interesting uh, operation we were the ship that was chosen to take uh, bodies, unknown, unidentified bodies from the Korean War and uh, the Second World War uh, up the Potomac for burial with the unknown soldier from World War I. We actually had three bodies aboard because we had a body from the European theater and a body from the uh, Eastern, the Japanese or, or Orient. Theater, uh, and then one from uh, from uh, Korea, and so we had a very interesting uh, op operation on the fantail, where the senior uh, non-commissioned officer moved the three bodies around on the fantail, and then, like having peas in a pod, uh, an enlisted man picked one not to go mm. to Arlington. And so we had a burial at sea. Mm. So we don't know 
whether the unknown from World War II was in the Eastern Theater or the Western Theater, but we know we have two there. So with great fanfare, you know, we steamed up the Potomac and transferred the bodies, and they are now buried with the unknown soldier from World War I. Wow. That was the end of my naval career. And I got out on a Friday and I drove all weekend uh, to start law school at Ole Miss on Monday morning. Mm. Uh, and it was very early on Monday morning because our classes were from 6.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. There was no air conditioning in the law school. And it was very hot in the summer in Oxford. Um, <clears throat> I uh, graduated from uh, the law school there in uh, 1960, and I was going to Yale for graduate work, but I was asked at the last minute to remain and teach for a year because they had a very sudden vacancy on the faculty that needed to be filled. This is at Ole Miss so, still? Hmm. This is still at Ole Miss? Yeah. So <laughs> there I was teaching friends who had been fellow students uh, a month before, which was challenging. And I taught everything that anyone more senior didn't want to teach. So I, I taught a lot of things that year. Uh, <clears throat> probably the most interesting aspect of my teaching is that my office directly overlooked the uh, corner bedroom of two Miss Americas, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Linda Lee Mead and uh, Marianne Mobley. So I had a constant stream of students in my office trying to, trying to catch a see. Yeah. The blinds were always closed. <laughs> I don't think they ever saw anything. But yeah. Linda Lee Mead's brother was a classmate of mine, so he was there too. And uh, Mary Ann was a good friend of my sister's who was there uh, at the same time. Yeah. She was a student. So uh, I was fortunate in getting a a grant from the, uh, the uh, Ford uh, Rockefeller, I can't remember which foundation, but a foundation um, sponsored a major institute in international legal studies in, uh, uh, at Bolt Hall, University of California, the law school there. And so I got a grant for that program, and I uh, headed to uh, Berkeley by train, uh, got to Oakland and took a taxi over to the International Center where I was going to stay. And I was there during the height of the Civil Rights Movement where there were card tables set up on all the sidewalks taking up money to send Freedom Riders to Mississippi from which I had just come. So uh, uh, there was a lot of ferment there at Berkeley at the time. Uh, and then I went from there uh, to do my graduate work at Yale. Yale had allowed me to postpone my grant there. And uh, I graduated there in 1962. And uh, I went to Chicago for the annual meeting of law teachers in December and they had what they call the slave market and this long passageway where the people in charge of graduate programs like Yale and Harvard and Columbia, um, they sat out and tried to snag faculty or deans to get interviews for their students who wanted to go into teaching. And I knew I wanted to return to the South and uh, the best job uh, available was at the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to come interview and did come in February. I left New Haven in the sleet and the snow and got off in Jacksonville. In those days you couldn't fly to Gainesville. I got off the plane in Jacksonville. The sky was clear and blue in about 72 and I knew God meant me to come <laughs> to the University of Florida. <laughs> and so uh, uh, Fletcher Baldwin was also interviewing at that time. Fletcher was at the University of Illinois. And so we had never met, but we were instructed by the law school 
to find each other at the Jacksonville airport and to come over here together on a Greyhound bus, which we did. And they put the two of us in the same motel room downtown, the old, uh, forgotten what it was called. It's still there, but it has a different name. Uh, but it was really cheap. And then we had to walk out to the law school to interview. And I, I find that all so shocking because of the way we court potential faculty now. We would have had somebody waiting at the airport in Jacksonville. We would have put them up in a very nice room and we certainly would not have had to walk out to the law school. But we both got offers from the University of Florida and both accepted them. Uh, and so this has been my academic home ever since. Uh, and Fletcher and I both stayed our whole careers. Unfortunately, he died last year uh, after a truck ran him into a ditch and he had a concussion. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so I, I've had a long career here. Mm -hmm. I retired in, in 1998 from full-time teaching, but um, I, I was fortunate enough to have a number of uh, visiting positions, and I taught in, uh, I was a Fulbrighter, uh, senior Fulbright lecturer in Korea in 1967. Um, I taught at uh, university uh, at uh, King, uh, Trinity College, Cambridge, in England. Uh, I taught a couple of summers at the Escuela Libre de Derecho in uh, uh, Mexico City. Um, I, I was a German Marshall Fund fellow in, uh, in teaching in Germany um, and uh, there may have been other, I, oh yes, I, I went to, uh, to uh, Jakarta to uh, lecture and do an introduction to a book on intellectual property. So I, I had, you know, good experiences. Mm. I, uh, I taught in uh, San Antonio at St. Mary's Law School in the, uh, I guess it would be called the winter or the spring semester of 1987, uh, excuse me, 1983. And as a result of that, I was appointed by the mayor of San Antonio who was later uh, a federal officer uh, to um, draft a, a new comprehensive historic preservation ordinance for the city of San Antonio. And this was funded in part by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And so uh, after I came back from my teaching stunt there, I continued to go back and forth for about four years until the ordinance was adopted by the city in uh, 1987, December. So that gave me uh, an interesting opportunity to do something that had a very tangible result. And that worked so well that later when the National Trust, um, I guess it was the National Park Service, had decided to do an urban park in Natchez, similar to the one they had done earlier in Boston. Um, I was asked to uh, draft a new preservation ordinance for the city of Natchez. So I and a colleague uh, went there and stayed for a week. It was uh, an unusual approach. Uh, but we spent a week and at the end of the week we presented the ordinance which they have now. That was a condition of the National Park Service doing the new park there was to have a better historic preservation ordinance. So uh, uh, I've had those kinds of practical experiences in terms of uh, helping communities, and I've done a lot for communities in Florida, particularly places like Apalachicola. <clears throat> and my specialty in later years was a seminar in historic preservation law, which was open to senior law students and to graduate students in the architecture school who were pr pursuing the preservation option. And I did that from 1976 until I retired in 1998. And uh, many of my graduates have gone on to be 
president of the, of the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation uh, and active in, in their local communities in Florida. Uh, Don Slesnick, for example, was the mayor of Carl Gables for three terms and he did so much to preserve Carl Gables and uh, stop the destruction of the 1920s and 30s building. He also served as president of the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation. So again, I hope I've had some impact in that area. And that's really what got me into <laughs> um, Rawlings House and Dudley Farm and various things of that sort locally. Mm. Mm. So, kind of, I want to ask you again, or a little bit more about your work doing preservation law. So, kind of, what got you into that? How did you start? That? Is um, that something you always I have you always to been interested in history and old buildings. And when my family went anywhere, and we didn't go much, but it was always uh, driving around the countryside, visiting family graves and houses in the country, and uh, uh, then uh, later uh, I uh, lived in an antebellum home that was built in 1858. Um, but uh, I, I simply grew up in a family that appreciated old things, <laughs> but more than new things. We never had anything new in our house. We, we recycled old family furniture. Um, and then I uh, uh, read a lot of history. I didn't major in it. I majored in uh, English Lit at Vanderbilt, uh, which was probably their strongest program at the time. And then I minored in French and Russian and Spanish. Mm. Mm. But, I, but I always... Uh, you know, visited historic buildings when I was traveling. And uh, as a result of my starting in that course in 1976, I guess, um, I ended up uh, being appointed to the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Board of Advisors. And I served four three-year terms as an advisor. And then in 1978, I incorporated the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation and served as its second president. Then when I retired in 1998, um, I was asked about being the general counsel for the incoming Secretary of State in Tallahassee, Catherine Harris, and her, by her transition team. And I said, I can't do that. I'm not a member of the Florida Bar. I'm a member of the Mississippi Bar. And they said, well, that, well, that's not a problem. I said, I'm sure it is a problem. <laughs> and so they, the transition team said, well, you, would you at least go to Sarasota and meet with her? And I said, yes. And I went down there on December the 23rd. And her Swedish husband's family was here from Sweden. I could hear all of them partying back in the bar. <laughs> and we sat down in the living room. and I said, uh, uh, the first thing you should know is I'm a Democrat and I wouldn't consider changing my registration to work for you. <laughs> she laughed and she said, that's not a problem. My daddy wouldn't change his to vote for me <laughs> in the primary. <laughs> so we did agree that I could be helpful. Uh, and so my title was a uh, special advisor for international affairs, historic preservation, and cultural resources. So I ended up then being on the Florida Arts Council, and I was on the uh, Historic Preservation Advisory Council. I chaired that. Uh, and so I just became, I mean, it all sort of took over my life. <laughs> no, yeah. And has ever since. No, and, I, and that's really what got me so involved in, in St. Augustine. Um, and uh, while I was still in Tallahassee, the legislature abolished all of the uh, preservation boards yeah. in the state except for the one in Pensacola. 
that one continued for another two years because uh, there was somebody in the legislature, a senator from Pensacola, who was very, very powerful. He later went to prison. Uh, but he had enough power to keep that board going. But uh, a, a, a member of the House from there realized that as soon as he was term limited, that Pensacola would also lose its preservation board and its state funding. Mm -hmm. So he came to see uh, Secretary Harris uh, looking for help in terms of what was going to happen in the future. And she turned him over to me. And so we had meetings out of the sunshine in my little apartment in Tallahassee. And we came up with the idea of having, and prior to that, when uh, St. Augustine, which had the oldest and original state preservation board funded by the state, and that was done under Leroy Collins, and so there were a number of state-owned historic properties there. And in St. Augustine, the city desperately wanted to take over the lease of those properties. And so we negotiated an agreement, up, and they did. Uh, that was not true in Pensacola. The city did not want to take over those properties, management of them, uh, or sublease. And so that, that was not a solution for Pensacola and the historic properties there. So uh, the um, long time, I, I guess he was editor uh, of the Pensacola paper, he's dead now. Uh, but his avocation was really history. Er Earl Bowden uh, from Pensacola, and is that with the Pensacola Democrat Times? What's the name of the Pensacola News Journal? Hmm? Was it the News Journal? Yeah, the yeah, Journal. that's it. So uh, uh, he came also to my apartment, and we came up with the idea of uh, creating a historic preservation program at UWF and then having that program and the university be in charge uh, of the historic prop the state owned historic properties. And as part of that, we would create an educational program with four tracks at UWF in the historic preservation area. And uh, so we did that. And uh, it's worked out very well, as a matter of fact. And uh, the person in head who had founded the Historic Preservation Program at the Architecture School here, Blair Reeves, and I, and um, a national known figure from uh, the Tennessee Has Historic Preservation Program, we went to Tallahassee to help advise on creating that educational program. Uh, so we spent quite a bit of time out there. Well, that, again, that had worked very well. In the meantime, the city had taken over the program in, in, in uh, St. Augustine. Well, unfortunately, even though the state would not let title to the properties go, uh, they didn't pro provide any funding. And the city of St. Augustine was losing uh, about $400,000 a year managing those properties. And <clears throat> so uh, uh, a person who had been a uh, longtime president of Flagler College but was in the legislature, uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Bill Proctor, William Proctor, uh, he uh, came to us and uh, said we need to figure out some way to take care of the properties because the city can't afford it. And the city did not want to renew. The mayor had said, we're not going to renew the sublease of the properties. So uh, on the basis of the success of the Pensacola arrangement, um, the, um, uh, the, the representatives, Representative Proctor, appointed a special task force to figure out a solution for uh, 
St. Augustine and their 38 state-owned historic properties there. Well, uh, I was on that task force uh, along with uh, um, two other UF faculty members, three actually, Kathy Deegan and uh, uh, Father Gannon or Professor Gannon, Dr. Gannon, and Kathy Deegan. So, uh, and then there were two faculty members from UWF and uh, a few other experts. And we met uh, a number of times and we decided that the Pensacola model was the way we should go. And the final recommendation of the task force was the University of Florida become the steward of those properties and use them as a lab for various programs at colleges here at the university, and primarily the architecture school and the preservation program, but also tourism, um, well, all kinds of things. Uh, and indeed, all colleges were encouraged to look at St. Augustine and figure out whether there were things they could do there that would be profitable. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I was asked by a representative proctor to draft the legislation to accomplish this, which I did uh, based on what I had done in Pensacola, really. And um, uh, the bill went before the legislature, I believe, in 2006 and was unanimously approved. But the way I drafted it, um, it did not mandate the UF do it but it authorized UF to do it. And <clears throat> it was not until 2010 that the university agreed to do it because we first had to get agreement from the legislature that we could use the same formula for maintenance of the buildings in St. Augustine that we used on campus. Mm -hmm. And once we got that assurance, we signed the agreement and it really amounts to a lease of the properties uh, over there, yeah. the 38, and then we have uh, been very, very active there ever since. Wow. I've been vice chair of the board that manages it since the beginning, and Ed Popple has been the university staff person, if you will. He had just retired as vice president for financial affairs and agreed to take that on, and he's done a great job. I think UF has done a great job over there. And as an example of what we are doing, uh, on uh, May the 12th, we will open an exhibit uh, at Governor's House. And the site of Governor's House is the oldest site of European government in the, Uni the United States, uh, <clears throat> dating to 1572. Uh, there has been a Governor's House on that site. Now, the early ones were wooden and burned, but uh, this actual piece of land <laughs> has, has had a governor's house on it since 1572. Wow. So um, it's now, uh, it was transferred by the federal government to the state of Florida, I can't remember, but probably around 1968. Mm. And uh, so that's our most important building there. Yeah. Are you familiar with it? I can't, it's, it's the building, I can't the large building, Coquina building, that's on the west end of the plaza. Okay. Uh, when the, when the uh, Spaniards came back to the mainland from, um, from, okay. the, from Anastasia Island, you know, the first settlement they were first north of the city, and uh, the Indian chief actually gave them a longhouse uh, as their headquarters. Well, they, the, the Spaniards very quickly wore out their welcome within about seven months. And so the Indians were firing arrows at them. Uh, so they moved out to Anastasia Island and were there until 1572 and then they came back. And during that brief period, the Law of the Indies had been published uh, detailing 
just how Newtown and the New World had to be laid out. And the government house had to be facing the plaza and where this Newtown was on the water, you had to be able to see the church, the cathedral uh, going and coming. And so it's very, very detailed. And that town plan in St. Augustine itself is a National Historic Landmark. Mm. And so it, it's still what you have there today is exactly what you had in 1572, laid wow. out in 1572. Wow. So uh, in any event, to jump forward a couple hundred years or more, <laughs> um, that's, that's our major property there. Again, we have 37 other properties that we manage. Some are leased commercially mm -hmm. and others are used for interpretation. Mm -hmm. But uh, at Governor's House on May the 12th, we're going to open an exhibit of some of the collection that the Vickers gave us this past December. And I hope you've been to the barn to see the Vickers collection. Uh, so we're, we're going to hang about uh, 75 pieces from that collection in Governor's House, and we have a big event coming up uh, in connection with that. And it's our hope that over the years, each year we'll do a Harn, something from the Harn collection there. Of course, the Vickers collection itself had 1,200 pieces, so with just the Vickers collection, we could do several exhibits. Wow. So those are the kinds of things we do over there. Yeah. And um, that uh, I'm still very involved in. That's very exciting. Um, so with such a, a vast kind of career, specifically in teaching and with working with and through UF, I kind of want to talk, talk, ask you a bit more about how you came to Oak Hammock and kind of how those relationships continue. Well. Even uh, I think my mother <laughs> is responsible. <laughs> uh, my mother was living in a house I owned in Goffew, two blocks, two, two doors up the street from me. Uh, she had lost her vision. She, mm -hmm. she, had, she and her husband had moved from uh, Oxford, Mississippi, which was his childhood home, an antebellum home his family lived in there. And he had uh, a stroke um, in the 1970s, a severe stroke. So they sold out all their properties in Oxford and moved to Amelia Island Plantation, uh, built a home there. And then uh, 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 as, as he was dying, my mother was losing her vision to macular degeneration. And she could no longer drive or Managed very well, so I offered her a house I owned in Goffew, two doors from mine, um, to live in as long as she liked. And so she was there for about seven years. And then um, uh, during the summer, she had a visitor from Oxford, Mississippi, a good friend, and she asked that friend to bring her out to the Oak Hammock sales office on 34th Street. This was in the planning phases because my mother had decided she needed more care and she didn't want to be a burden on me or my sisters. So without telling us, she had the friend from Oxford bring her out to the sales office and she signed up for Okama <laughs> and then told me about it. So then uh, I helped her select an apartment, um, 3213, uh, which was on the atrium in building two. Uh, and uh, we uh, began, you know, choosing furnishings and how it was to be, colors and what, like, what that sort of thing. Well, when Oak Hammock finally opened, my mother's health had deteriorated to the point that she never moved into the apartment. Her furniture was in there. But uh, she went immediately into assisted living here in the health pavilion. And she was the third person to move in. So she was really a pioneer here. 
and uh, but she had retained the apartment and she was very prescient uh, because she put my my younger sister's name down as the primary occupant of the apartment mm. and her as secondary. Well, my younger sister, who was in Jacksonville at the time, uh, suddenly lost her vision in both mm. eyes, macular wow. degeneration, and had to sell her house in Mandarin and uh, also her place at Amelia Island Plantation. And so she moved here to the apartment and was here for about 13 years before she died here of pancreatic cancer about two years ago. So um, that's how my family became so <laughs> much a part of uh, Okama. Uh, and of course I was here uh, almost every day visiting, uh, checking on things. Um, then, uh, Soon after uh, Bernie Matchin became president of the university, um, he appointed me to the board of directors of Okama. Uh, I tried to find the letter of appointment, but I couldn't find it, but it was within the first year uh, of Okama's existence. And um, he had brought his mother and father to live at Okama when he became president. Uh, and they became close friends of my mother, so I saw his parents often. Um, so again, uh, he appointed me to the board of directors, and there are three classes of directors under the Articles of Incorporation. Uh, they're presidential appointees, and they have no term limit on their terms. Um, and their community members and their alumni members. Now, sometimes they overlap, they can and, and do. But uh, I was a presidential appointee, so my term had no limit. But uh, almost 10 years to the day, I had to resign because I uh, had made the decision to move in here. And at that time, um, we did not have any residents who were members of the board, um, or at least that was the case for uh, most of the time, just maybe a year before I stepped down, we did make the president of the residence council an, an official, ex officio uh, member of the board. And then I think at that same time, we gave that member voting rights, I'm not sure. Uh, just before I resigned, we voted to have a second resident um, as, a, as a member, and, and so presently we do have two members of the board of directors who are on, who are residents. But um, the, the idea behind that, of course, was that there's a conflict of interest in having you set your own uh, fees, annual fees, and things like that. So I, I had a, a very, uh, very uh, direct relationship with Okama for 10 years as a member of the board of directors. Uh, and then I've lived here now for five years. I think it's about five years. Uh, so that's how I got involved at Okama. Hmm. <laughs> and I also know that you're on the Working with ILR, um, could, I've heard good things about everyone who's mentioned it to me. So, um, can you tell, talk to us a little bit more about what that is and how that came to? Well, be? ILR stands for the Institute for Learning and Retirement, and from the very beginning, uh, there was a determination to have uh, both an educational but at the same time fun component. Uh, to live life here, uh, uh, a program where courses would be offered um, and it was not to be restricted to residents, uh, it was to be open to the community. And although there would be uh, a charge for the courses, it would be nominal and indeed I think it's about $10 a course. Um, 
And until the pandemic struck, uh, the courses were offered in the Oak Room, typically. And there were many, many people from the community who drove out for the courses. And uh, members who lived here could just walk downstairs and, and sit down for the courses. Uh, there was no such thing as Zoom. Uh, <clears throat> and I wish there never had been such <laughs> a thing as Zoom. But um, we had, from the beginning, a board of directors for the ILR that set policy and still does. And then we had uh, a curriculum committee. And the curriculum committee um, had subcommittees, a, a humanities subcommittee and a sciences subcommittee, which is the case at present. Uh, and we also encouraged board members, both the board of directors and for the uh, curriculum committees uh, from uh, the city, you know, from outside. They did not have to be members of Okama. And so we have had chairs or presidents of the board of directors. The, the one who just stepped down was uh, a community member. Uh, the, the one who replaced him as a community member, but someone who was uh, in the original uh, formation of Okama. She was the dean of educational mm. programs, mm. Sarah Lynn McCray. Um, so as soon as I moved in, I became a member of the curriculum committee for ILR. Have you ever taught? Uh, yes, I, I've given, given several courses, none of them on law. <laughs> My courses have all been on uh, the history of gardens around the world. Wow. Uh, on architecture, I've done a lot of architecture courses, course on Palladio and Palladianism. Um, so I, I have uh, actually taught about six courses, and then I have facilitated uh, a number of other courses. Um, I've been the facilitator when Paul Ortiz has come to lecture. Um, so the facilitators are supposed to be OCAMIC residents, but presenters are often members of the faculty mm -hmm. or community members who know a lot about something. So you mentioned, did you say history of gardens? Is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, uh, I began with the very earliest ones in China and, uh, you know, how gardens as ornamental mm. creations came to be. Um, and it's interesting, interesting, my research showed that the, the gardens in China, which were probably the oldest, uh, were based on early Chinese paintings, scroll paintings. So the, the, the paintings came first and then the gardens uh, came second. Then there were early gardens in, you know, Mesopotamia um, and in uh, Egypt and, and the valley there. So, you know, I started with those and then moved forward. Um, Do you garden? Do you I you have a had garden? a substantial garden in Gulfview when I lived there. But here I have a little raised garden plot. We I don't know whether you noticed them or not, but they're community garden right down there. And anybody who wants can sign up for, for a garden. So I brought a number of plants from my home in Gulfview mm -hmm. that are here with me. Mm -hmm. um, but I have uh, always been interested in gardens. Mm, yeah, I think they're I, uh, have, truly fascinating. I have visited lots and lots of gardens around the world. Mm. What are some of the most, I guess, striking plants or flowers or maybe even vegetables that you've seen in some gardens? Maybe have you ever seen like any really exotic plants or trees in gardens? Oh yeah, like, what, yeah, what it's, everywhere. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've I've had the uh, great fortune to be able to travel uh, all my life, mm. and uh, my uh, I've done all seven continents. Wow! Uh, I've done exotic things like go by Panas up the Niger to Timbuktu. I've spent a week at Easter Island. 
uh, I did a trek around Mount Everest. The, there's really nowhere I wanted to go that I haven't been. So <laughs> that may sound awful, but it's No, that true. sounds actually amazing. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. And, I, and there are certain places that are favorites mm. that I've been to, you know, 10 or 12 times, like Paris, mm. uh, London, uh, places in Italy. Mm. So, uh, you know, I've just seen such incredible wow. gardens, you know, the Renaissance gardens um, that still exist. Um, and, you know, the gardens, so different. Uh, the uh, in the 17th century, the British came to a totally different kind of garden, a very natural garden. Capability Brown is the best known of the landscape architects from that period. Uh, there's some precedent for it in the Netherlands or whatever it was called at the time. But uh, it's a very distinctive English type of garden that's more natural looking. Uh, but but really very artificial. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, then the, the, today's gardens, the, the, the chief plantsman uh, in the world is Pete Udolph, who's Dutch. But if you know the High Line in New York City, uh, he was the person who picked the plants for that. Mm. He picked the plants for the, uh, uh, the garden uh, in Chicago um, for the millennium. Uh, and then he did the plantings down at uh, Battery City in the uh, south tip of Manhattan. Uh, and so I pursued some of his urban gardens in uh, Rotterdam recently. Um, and so there, you know, there, there's still their innovations going on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you about a little. Okay, so hmm. more about kind of what you what are you gardening here? I wanted to ask you that too before I go more about. How well, again, I'm I'm not trying to grow vegetables. There are mm -hmm. a lot of people who are growing vegetables, but I I just have plants that do well here. I like natives to the extent possible, and. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and what I call pass along plants, uh, heirloom plants. Um, for example, Shelley Fraser Mickle, who is a well-known author here. Shelley gave me uh, a clump of what she calls Arkansas ditch lilies that her mother brought her from Arkansas. Well, I know those lilies well because for many years, my family had a place in the Ozarks, which I inherited sold a couple of years ago, but driving from Memphis to get there at the right time of year, those ditches were all lined with these uh, mm -hmm. orange uh, day lilies, really. Um, and the Arkansans have no sense of uh, style, <laughs> and their ditches are all, all the little creeks there, the ditches are ditch number so-and-so, ditch number so-and-so instead of so-and-so creek. So I have Arkansas ditch lilies <laughs> that bloom dependably in, uh, in July. Then I have yarrow, which blooms twice a year here. Mm. And I've noticed yarrow is ubiquitous around the world. It's native to Florida, although you don't see it too often, but uh, I was in Iceland about three years ago, and it was growing wild all over Iceland. Wow. I've seen it growing all over the world. And so I've got a lot of it blooming right now. Um, and uh, again, there are other things I brought with me. I do grow herbs like mint uh, and uh, rosemary for use in my kitchen. Yeah. But uh, again, I, I focus on, on uh, natives. Mm -hmm. I always have uh, the state wildflower uh, mm -hmm. growing. The anyway, that that's that's what I'm. Mm -hmm. That's very fascinating. I don't, I don't want anything that's. Well, I have. Uh, uh, I always have an orchid blooming in my house, my apartment here. <clears throat> that's I. 
I know um, uh, my grandfather and my great aunts, they both have green thumbs as well, so they're big into gardening too. They mostly grow, well my grandfather, he mostly grows like, like vegetables, so like tomatoes, um, stuff like that. But gardening for, as you put it, like an ornamentally is, is very fascinating to me too. I remember seeing my neighbors growing up with like lots of lovely rose bushes and stuff in their garden in Georgia and like the dogwoods would always look really nice and stuff, you know, so. Well, I, I, um, I, I, as a, I guess I must have been, oh, from the age of uh, nine or 10 to uh, 13, uh, we lived in my grandparents' house and our next door neighbor had three or four acres of gardens. And so she and I became good friends and mm -hmm. she would give me uh, starts of things which I would transplant to land we had. So I, I became interested that early mm. um, and never lost that interest. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think uh, it's, there's an interesting relationship between your interest in historic sites and in gardening too. I don't see them as- Well, there's a wonderful things. and has been a very influential book for me by Andrea Wolf called The Founding Gardeners. And it's really about how important their gardens were to Washington, mm -hmm. John Adams, Jefferson, and Madison. And I had visited each of their homes, I don't know how many times from the time I was 18. Mm -hmm. But after reading Andrea Wolf's book on the founding gardeners and those four presidents, um, I went back and revisited each one with my great grandchildren. Mm. Uh, and they were entirely different experiences, entirely different. Um, Madison's Montpelier, have you been there? I haven't. Uh, it's a National Trust property near Charlottesville. And, and I urge you to read the book, The Founding Gardeners. But um, Madison, Actually, it was like a Chekhov, uh, that Russian term, the, the village, a fake village to show to visitors. Uh, Madison did that at Montpelier, and they would sit on the veranda on the back terrace and look at this slave village. I don't know whether it was entertainment or not, but it was not more than 200 feet from the veranda. Mm -hmm. And they were probably the house slaves, you know, that served the house. Uh, and so they lived better than the slaves who worked the fields. Mm -hmm. Potemkin village, that's what I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of. It was a Potemkin village. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'd never known that before. And so, you know, when I went back with my great grandchildren, I, I found that location. But um, according to Andrea's research, the only thing that got George Washington through that winter at Valley Forge was that every night he wrote letters to the person in charge of the plants and grounds at Mount Vernon, uh, telling them things he wanted done. One was to transplant native trees onto their property, native plants, things like that. And he was constantly rethinking and re-landscaping. Um, and uh, I, I've had the good fortune to actually spend three nights at Mount Vernon uh, and be able to sit on the veranda there of the drink in the evening and look at the Potomac. Um, and, I, and again, I, I had a totally different feeling for it after reading about that. Same thing with John Adams' house mm -hmm. in Quincy, Mass. Um, and with uh, uh, Jefferson's house. And I guess one of the most uh, charming stories I know about Jefferson um, is from reading uh, about his, during that period he was our ambassador. Uh, John Adams was our ambassador to England. 
and he was having a terrible time negotiating a trade treaty for our new nation with Britain. And he asked uh, Jefferson if he would come over from Paris and help him, um, and Jefferson did. And so the two of them were very, very stressed frustrated after one particular meeting. Um, <clears throat> and some say it was with George III who turned his back on them and wouldn't speak. Um, I think it's more likely it was George III's minister. In any event, they decided that the best way to deal with their frustration was to rent a horse and buggy and go look at great gardens mm -hmm. of England. And so, um, they did, and they got as far north as Birmingham. But the, the very first garden they visited, and one of the most famous of all gardens, I've gone to twice in the last 10 years. And uh, I could just feel, you know, their excitement at being there and how much it influenced uh, uh, Monticello, Jefferson's uh, landscape. Wow. Um, so if you just think of that, how important that was to our forefathers, our founding gardeners, if you will. Uh, gardening was a huge thing for them. Yeah, that's exciting. That's, that's incredibly fascinating. I never known or thought of uh, uh, that for any of, any of those, those men. So that's definitely a, a unique yeah. take on history. Wow. Wow, thank you for that. Um, uh, I want to ask you a little bit more about ILR. Um, I know you talked about you being on the committee and you teaching histories of garden and other things like that. What are some favorite courses that you've attended or that you've seen? Uh, one uh, early on, in fact, I might not even have been living here yet, but Jerry uh, Kirkpatrick, who I think you interviewed, somebody interviewed, mm -hmm. uh, Jerry gave an incredible series on uh, foreign relations in uh, the Far East, uh, and uh, that was that was probably my favorite of all the ones. But uh, again, I've attended lectures on just about everything. We people here are interested. One of the ones that I I came up with recently was uh, quilting across America. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd become really interested in the, the quilts from G's Bend. Are you familiar with those? Uh, this is a black community that is in Alabama mm. on, uh, I've forgotten the river it's on. But uh, basically, uh, as a matter of Jim Crow government, it had been cut off from civilization. Mm. It was very difficult to get there. And the women there uh, came up with their own quilting style, which is very abstract. Mm. It's not your typical quilt at all. And um, a number of years ago, um, I was in uh, um, Washington, I guess, the first time I saw them, and there was an exhibition of quilts from G's Bend, and I was just blown away by it. Wow. I later saw the exhibit in Mobile at the Museum of Art there. But some of these quilts now sell for tens of thousands of dollars. Wow. Uh, but I urge you to, it's very easy to find, there's a, a documentary on the quilts from G's Bend. I'm not sure that's the precise title, but you can find it. And it is absolutely superb. Uh, and the first place the uh, quilts were shown were at the Whitney in New York City. Mm. But then there were, again, it traveled around the, the country. Uh, and so we, we showed that documentary as part of the series. But then we had uh, a session dealing with the quilters here. We have a very, very active quilters group here. And then uh, uh, a quilter who was on the uh, faculty here uh, did a session on her quilts. And uh, Amy Vigilante, who was the longtime director of the 
gallery, university gallery, among other things. And she and her mother had gone to see that original show at the Whitney in New York, which is what turned her on to quilting. So, uh, you know, the, the variety, we, we try to look for relatively esoteric areas that people are interested in. And uh, uh, we have a, an ongoing session on opera. Uh, and that's been going on from the beginning. And there are usually about 15 people participating. Uh, and uh, we have a, 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 a course in which uh, chamber music people actively participate. Um, I mean, they, that's what the course is, is they get together and play. Um, so, uh, and you know, we have sports, uh, esoteric areas of sciences, you name it. Yeah. We've done it or we, we, we're we very open. We ask anybody who has an interest, something they would like to pursue, would like to be, would like to facilitate to give us a, a, a summary and, and usually we do it. Would you say that's something that makes not only the ILR program special, but OCAMIC really special? So absolutely, mm. absolutely. It's just uh, uh, one of the special things. But the idea for continuing education that's fun. It's fun because you don't have to have, to have an exam. You don't take an exam. <laughs> yeah. I, I took the, uh, the beginning Spanish course for the first three years I was here, and then I switched to German because I had never studied German, but I've been in Germany a lot in recent years and I wanted to know more. So I'm in beginning German now. <laughs> that's very, that's very, that's awesome. I never, um, I don't, I, there were some German classes in my high school, but I never, I never took them either. Um, what else would you say makes OCHEM like really unique and special? Um, well, I think, think it's the campus itself, yeah. you know, 130 acres, and much of it uh, is under conservation easement so that the woods cannot be disturbed. And we have a policy, if a tree falls, it stays there uh, mm -hmm. in the conservation area woods. Wow. Because, of course, uh, that is a natural cycle that encourages all sorts of other things. And we have deer, you know, we once had a bear. Um, we see wild turkey. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the deer can be a problem sometimes because they eat our uh, the gardens. gardens. But uh, uh, so I think it's the natural setting that is so wonderful. I, I walk the periphery of the campus every day and then we have, uh, trails through the woods that are paved so they're accessible to people in wheelchairs. Mm. Um, we have paths that are not paved that uh, are available as well. But uh, this is just a, such a fantastic place for people to stay active. And uh, of course we have two pools, we have the fitness center with all kinds of equipment. Um, the fact that, uh, except the last month, <laughs> because of shortage of personnel at Shands, we can get all the lab work done right here mm. in our clinic and not have to go somewhere else for lab work. We have a dental clinic here, so I switch to the dentist here uh, and to the doctor here when I was a primary care physician when I moved. So. You know, having all of that at hand uh, and not having to fight traffic even if, if you can still drive, mm -hmm. and a lot of people can't. Mm -hmm. This is just uh, uh, an extraordinary place. Mm. That's awesome. <laughs> and the food is good. And the food's good. I hear that. It is good. It sure is. I, it's, yeah. it's unbelievably good for mm -hmm. an institution. It's very, very good. And, of course, a very, very active Gator Lounge, bar, the bar, mm, the bar, very popular. Haven't, haven't, haven't come, haven't come well, around to that one it's yet. It's not but, open until uh, about four thirty. Ah, uh, well, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll have to come for some later interviews. It seems, <laughs> and yeah. Um, uh, wow, that's awesome. What um, 
Do you have any? I have a question. You said you've been to all seven continents. Can you tell me how you got to Antarctica? I've been yeah, yeah. wondering about it this whole time. Yeah, I, uh, it, it, was an, it was the perfect trip, really. Um, I flew to, uh, I can't even think of the name of it right this minute, but it's on the west coast of Argentina. Yeah. It's about a four-hour flight south of uh, Buenos Aires. So I flew to Buenos Aires and took a plane. I can't think of the name of it. It was originally a penal colony, uh, but it's the jumping off point for cruises to, uh, to Antarctica. And I spent four days there hiking around the area and then uh, boarded the ship. Um, and it was um, the National Geographic Explorer. So, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of National Geographic lecturers, but the special lecturer was Buzz Aldrin mm. and his wife. And wow. so that was pretty exciting. And in fact, having him aboard gave us access to going ashore and I had Antarctica at some of our stations that wouldn't have had us otherwise, but they wanted so much to have Buzz Aldrin uh -huh. that they let us come along with him. <laughs> <laughs> That's really and cool. it was a, a, a small ship, uh, not a huge ship. And we did get to go ashore a lot. And, you know, walking in the, the paths of, that the penguins made in the snow and being... Mm -hmm. We couldn't touch them, but they could touch us and did. Um, and uh, then we, we had kayaks uh, for kayaking around. And I, I, it, it was just an extraordinary experience. And we were very, very blessed with what I considered as an old Navy man, a very, very easy crossing going and coming. A lot of people have very rough experiences. And in, in fact, that keeps many people from doing it. Uh, but we were, we got down below the uh, the circle, and often cruises don't go that far south. So I, I considered it a, a perfect experience. That's awesome. Is it as cold as it looks in the pictures? I'm sorry. Is Antarctica as cold as it looks in the pictures? It looks really cold. No, not yeah. if you go at that time of year. No, hmm. no, it, it's uh, you know. It's not even freezing every night. Wow. Uh, so, and, and unfortunately, due to climate change, it's getting warmer. Uh, but uh, we had spectacular weather the whole time. Wow. That's incredible. That's really incredible. I had one more, too. Yeah. Um, so on a completely unrelated note, I was curious about, um, since you have this background in historic preservation and building preservation, what you think of the current state of um, how buildings are changing around campus, around the campus area with like student housing and big apartments being built? Um, what, well, I, I think that the university is, uh, has done a very good job. That's, that's another story. but. Um, I have in my possession this little pamphlet that the university put together about 1970 called The Space Story at the University of Florida. And it was done for the legislature. It's been digitized, so you can find it. Um, and it was making the case to demolish every historic building on campus. And it, if you look at the centerfold, it looks like a tic-tac-toe thing with X's and O's. And then uh, it, it, the next page, there's a priority list for demolition. And the top, the first four for demolition were Flint, Floyd, Peabody, and Anderson. Wow. And uh, this was to, make, to help make the case for funding for demolition of the old buildings and, and putting in new buildings. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that didn't happen. Uh, and so that is what started some of the faculty with their movement to save the, the buildings. And the, the earliest people involved were Sam Proctor and Blair Reeves, who started the preservation program in, in architecture, and uh, one or two others. 
I became involved very early on because Blair had approached me about doing that seminar together in historic preservation law. Um, and then when Marshall Kreiser came to be president of the university, um, and that was what? Uh, that, that was about 1979 or 80. Um, Sam Proctor and Blair Reeves and Bill Gozer and Mark Barrow and I asked for an appointment to meet with them to talk about the old buildings on campus and the terrible job the university was doing of taking care of them. Uh, and uh, you know who Sam Proctor was, you know who Blair Reeves was. Well, Mark Barrow was in the first graduating class of the medical school here, and it was the founder of the Matheson Museum downtown. He had a PhD in history as well as his medical degree, and he and his wife have been pioneers in historic preservation in Gainesville and, and beyond. And Bill Goza was a graduate of the law school, but he was interested in history. And um, uh, and I, so I guess that's the five. So we were granted an interview with with uh, with Kreiser on late Thursday afternoon on his first homecoming weekend. And so the five of us met with him in his office and laid it on him about <laughs> what a bad job the university was doing with respect to preserving its historic buildings. And uh, I, I, you probably don't know him. He lives here now. He's down on the first floor of my wing. Uh, and unfortunately, his health is deteriorating. He's in his 90s. but. Uh, at the end of the meeting, I, I, I knew him through the law in the bar, and he'd been president of the Florida Bar and a graduate of our law school. So I'm the only one who really knew him well. And I said, and, and by the way, Marshall, there is this new state law that says we have to do this as a matter of law. And um, he asked me to write him a legal memorandum on it which I did, and uh, after reading it, and he saw, indeed, this new statute required sensitivity to uh, historic buildings. It, it really combined federal section 4F of the Highway Transportation Act and uh, uh, section 106, uh, no, uh, 106 of uh, the National Historic Preservation Act I may have reversed those, um, and and uh, so Marshall, instead of fighting it, had the university planner at the time, whose name was John, uh, I think, of it, uh, implement the law, and at the same time, the Florida Trust, which I had incorporated in '78, was having. Uh, its first annual meeting of the Florida Trust here in Gainesville. And so I asked my, uh, uh, the president if he and his wife would come to the opening event at the Thomas Center and proclaim a campus historic district, which he agreed to do. And that, and that had no legal authority, but he had given us the authority to try to uh, get a campus national historic district listed on the National Register of Historic Places. We already had 11 buildings individually listed on the National Register, but we didn't have a district. And uh, that's much more protective. Than just the buildings. So, so um, uh, he authorized us to uh, write a nomination, uh, do a nomination for a National Historic District on campus. 
and uh, Murray Larry, who later was, uh, uh, worked for the graduate program, graduate school here for a number of years. She actually wrote the National Register Historic District nomination, which was then approved at the state mm -hmm. level and in Washington. So what's been done within the National Register boundaries, I think, has been very sensitive to the existing red brick buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the program, programmatic memorandum of agreement between the university and the Division of Historical Resources makes it clear that in the original RFP, they have to notify people that this is a district. They have to follow the Secretary of the Interior Standards and Guidelines for, for a new construction or for addition. Um, and it gives the division uh, the authority to review the plans and suggest changes along the way. And I think that's worked pretty well. Now, the, of course, I'm just talking about the boundaries of the original, the National Historic District. Outside those boundaries, totally different things have occurred. And that area is the, it's the Murphy area, right? That's the historic designated? Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I can't recall the exact boundaries, but they, they run behind the engineering building to the, to the south and up to University Avenue and as far west as the stadium, uh, the, you know, the road in front of the stadium. Uh, so uh, I think it's made a, I, I know it's made a big difference <laughs> because the, the attitude went from wanting to tear those buildings down to realizing they were helpful in fundraising. You know, that was the University of Florida to the older, richer people. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Ben Hill Griffin, who was a major benefactor of the university, when he heard that the university had plans to tear down Floyd Hall, which is where he had gone, he said, if, if, they, tear, if they tear down Floyd Hall, I'll never give them another penny. Mm -hmm. Well, that caught their attention. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's, so, um, he's the guy uh, who the I, named after. I give Marshall Kreiser a great deal of credit for changing the situation and the attitude here uh, on campus with respect to historic preservation. The buildings are so cool. And I mean, Flint Hall, that's like, a, was my second home as a student. So I'm glad it's still here. I'm glad someone fought for it back yeah. before I was even alive. Well, the original Florida Museum of Natural History was in that building in Flint mm. Hall. Oh, I never knew that. That's where it got started. And then it moved to, uh, um, the Siegel building downtown and was there you know, for a long, long time until they built the uh, Temple Mound on Museum Road. Mm. Uh, I just thought of another question for you. It's about the Siegel building. I heard a rumor that the Siegel building was sold to Trimark Properties. Do, do you know anything about that? No. Okay. I don't. I don't. The Siegel building is, is it's an interesting story. I don't know how much you know about it, but it was being built as a hotel. I think it was going to be called the Dixie Hotel uh, when the uh, Florida crash occurred, which was a little before the national crash in the 30s, late 20s. And so it, it stood there unfinished for a number of years. And then a, a woman named Georgia Siegel gave the university the money to, uh, uh, to buy it and complete it. And so it housed various university functions and still was when I came here in 62. And a lot of top secret research was done for the government for the Defense Department there during World War II, uh, strictly off limits to the public. But the museum was on the lower floors, so they moved from Flint Hall and to Siegel, the Siegel building. And then uh, uh, it, it must have been about 1975, well probably when uh, the new, the, when the Temple Mound building was built for the museum, 
uh, they abandoned that, and, and then the university abandoned the Siegel Building entirely, and it stood empty for a while. And then uh, in 1978, uh, the federal government amended the uh, federal tax laws to encourage historic preservation of uh, old and historic buildings. And so um, John Mills was the attorney who represented the developers, I think, who did the turn the Siegel Building into commercial and residential space. So they were able to get a 25% uh, tax benefit. Uh, they were able to get take advantage of uh, these these uh, tax incentives that were the best we've ever had. And they went on for about 10 years. So the Siegel Building is a product of that period when we were giving lots of benefits for uh, restoration of historic buildings. And, and so uh, from the very beginning, the uh, private dining club was on the end there. Uh, you know, and, uh, and then uh, uh, three floors of offices and then three or four floors of reg residential. And, and I don't know, it, well, it, it would not surprise me to hear that Trimark has, had bought it. Mm. I just, I wasn't sure if it's registered as a historic place. Oh yes, or, okay. it's a national register. They, that was one of the first things they did was get it listed on the national register because otherwise they would have not qualified for all those tax incentives. So yes, it's on the National Register. I was worried about it because I saw it's right next to that new uh, Blount Hall that they built for Santa Fe, and then I heard Trimark bought it, and I was like, please don't tear it down and build an apartment I, complex. I don't think they can tear it down. I, 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 that's a, I thought maybe you would know something. You've relieved me a little bit. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't think they could tear it down. Um, I think the city would resist that. But, uh, but, but again, uh, it's, it's definitely on the register. Okay. Um, do you have anything else that you want to add? Before we do? Thank you so much for your time today. No, I, I, I would simply add that I'm very, very excited about the Proctor Oral History Program. I think it's one of the greatest things the university mm. has uh, done uh, in its history, and I certainly appreciate what uh, the program has done for us in St. Augustine, uh, capturing the uh, history of uh, the black community that was so active in the 60s and are so rapidly dying. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time.